It is my delight to welcome my friend, my former colleague from Wheaton College. In fact, uh, there are three former deans from Wheaton College right here. We have Lynn Coick seated down here, Ed Stetzer, and, and myself. And so uh, we're going to form a support group later on as, as former, <laughs> former people. No, I'm just kidding. It was, it, we had a great experience there, and uh, it was a great, great college. He is currently at Talbot, and you can read all about him here, but I'm going to tell you some things that you probably can't read about him. Number one, he does a podcast. Uh, it's called the Stetzer, gosh, I forgot what this is called, Church Leaders Podcast. Thank you. I have some notes here in my hand. Thanks for listening. Yes. 70,000 uh, downloads every, every month, and he also does a radio show. In fact, he did it here this morning from this location. And he gave a shout out to Lanier Theological Library on 250 stations all around the country on Moody Bible, uh, Moody Network, right? And so uh, we were grateful for that. Uh, he, he is, he is, his, his finger is on the pulse of what's going on here in culture like nobody I've ever seen. And his insights, his wisdom, he's a person to know, he's a person to hear and to listen to and to heed because he's, he's, He's thought about these things deeply and prayed about them thoroughly. We are grateful, Ed, for your spirit, for your life, for your influence. And we're grateful that we have the chance tonight to be able to hear you. Would you join me in welcoming Ed Stetzer? This topic tonight is, uh, to be perfectly blunt, it's kind of a niche topic. This is not something that uh, millions of people are probably sitting around wondering about in their local churches, but you knew the topic before you were here, so I hope you're interested in the topic. We're going to talk some about uh, understanding the fragmentation and the futures of evangelicalism, and that probably requires in and of itself some discussion and some definitions. And so I've been told this is the first time they use the big screen, so it's a bit understated, this tiny little screen that they have. I feel like I'm at a Taylor Swift concert or something. Um, <laughs> We are, we are never, ever getting back together um, like ever. So that being said, um, speaking of music, if you're a fan of movies and music, one of the places that beautifully came together is in a cinematic masterpiece called The School of Rock starring Jack Black. And if you saw that movie along, okay, lots of people have seen that movie. There's a one scene in the movie where, and it's just up there for about a second or two, where this screen is, shows. And it's a bit blurry, but for these two seconds, this screen shows. And so some brilliant person on the internet uh, took a screenshot of that and said, well, what exactly is this? At this time, Jack Black was lecturing on the history of rock and roll music. Now, I know you didn't come to the Lanier Theological Library to learn the history of rock and roll music, but so somebody then took this and actually cleaned it up so you could kind of understand a bit of the history of rock and roll music. And I'm guessing this is the first time Dr. Dre and the Bee Gees have been mentioned at Lanier Theological Seminary, but, but here they are on the board. Now, why do I tell you this? Well, first of all, a few interesting things to note here. There's a history, I see some of you taking pictures of this, so you'll take this home, you'll spend hours and hours looking at this. But for example, I bet most of you did not know that hip hop and rap, hip hop and rap actually came out of disco. You say, how in the world could such a thing happen? It was actually DJs in the major cities between playing a song at a discotheque would then use spoken word and became a genre in and of itself. So things emerge from other things and they have a history that we can actually trace back. So, so then the question is, where does the gospel fit in this? And if you like Jack Black, an occasional Jack Black reference isn't so bad. <laughs> What about the gospel? There's actually a reference to a different movie called Nacho Libre, uh, but anyway, um, another cinematic masterpiece. So the, the better question is, who are uh, evangelicals? Who are evangelicals? Actually, even the way I say that determines what part of the country I'm from and what my own theological tradition is. Is it evangelicals? Is it evangelicals? Is it evangelicals? We'll talk about all of those things. Now, I don't make the assumption tonight that all of you come from an evangelical tradition. I'm going to explain a little bit of the framing of our conversation before we get to the fragmentation. So much like Jack Black would tell us on that blackboard, there's a history and we actually come from an historical journey. We are in some ways shaped by that historical journey. So there are certainly major denominational trees in 
the history of Christianity, right? So, and you can actually look at, this is actually just taken, I took this from Wikipedia, uh, they can't put it on Wikipedia unless it's true, so you know that it's quality <laughs> research that's actually there. So, um, so this actually traces uh, people who use the word Christian to describe themselves and the different traditions uh, over really what are, what are centuries, 2,000 years. And so you can actually see uh, Eastern Christianity on this side and Western Christianity on this side. And I imagine that watching online with us are people from perhaps Catholic traditions, uh, mainline Protestant traditions, maybe Eastern Orthodox traditions as well. Uh, my own family, I came to faith, heard the good news of the gospel in the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church. And uh, I see that one person remains from the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church. I appreciate your enthusiasm as well. Um, so, and, but my parents, my stepfather and mother, also came to faith in similarly uh, adjacent traditions. They subsequently converted to Eastern Orthodoxy, and he became an Antiochian Orthodox priest in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So I grew up Roman Catholic, though really, honestly, the Catholic Church was the church we did not go to on Sundays growing up Irish Catholic outside of New York City and then came to Christ in the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church. My family moved to Orthodoxy. And so what then does all this have to do with us as evangelicals? Now, I'm going to describe a little bit about ev what evangelicalism is, and it does relate to some of what's on the screen today. And again, it's very difficult to, how do you blow out some of these categories? So, uh, for example, when we talk about Calvinism and Anglicanism and where's Arminianism and the response to that and Lutheranism and more, I see Lynn Coix here and Lynn and I started a podcast together and you were, you were my Arminian friend and I was your Reformedish friend and we tried to illustrate what evangelicalism looked like across the breadth that's there. She's now at Houston Christian University continuing to do her important good work in the New Testament and beyond. So it's kind of tricky because you can actually describe and define this, and people use charts and describe and define these things in, in sort of different ways. It's like, what, how do we look about what the church is? And, and again, I'm not going to walk through this because this would just be uh, exhausting. You know, and, and actually people come to different conclusions. What does the Reformation look like? What's the radical Reformation? Where, uh, where you know, I mean, I, I, when I talk to David Capes, my friend of, of lots of years, when I talked to David Capes, he said, tonight we'll have non-denominational people, we'll have Baptist people, we'll have Church of Christ people, we'll have Pentecostal people. And part of the challenge is even some of those traditions. So like the Church of Christ and is part of what's called the Restoration Movement. So, so, and Baptists are similar to this. They actually tend not to, and kind of in the popular understanding of those traditions, to see themselves as part of a family tree, but a restoration. That's why it's called the Restoration Movement, a restoration of New Testament Christianity. So for the typical modern evangelical, for them, there was Jesus, the disciples, the early church fathers, and then Martin Luther, and then them. And so we have to be careful to recognize that we all do come from different traditions. One of my favorite little, my little favorite little comics is this one, uh, Churches and Christian Movements Throughout History. And, and here it says, so here is where our movement came along and finally got the Bible right. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, and Jesus is so lucky to have us is the phrase that's there beyond that. But we are part of a tradition mostly here tonight, and I certainly am of evangelicalism. Let me tell you a little bit how I began to learn that. I came to Christ in the, as I mentioned, the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church, later became a church planter, and Donna and I began our journey planting churches in the inner city of Buffalo, New York, among the urban poor. At the time, Buffalo was the fastest shrinking city in America. We lived in a very crime-ridden uh, neighborhood in a very crime-ridden time. It was the late 80s, early 90s. The crack epidemic had spread, spread through American cities. The mayor of Buffalo, when I met him and said we were moving in, for some reason he started calling me Eddie. It was kind of an Irish thing. Never asked him to call me Eddie. I've never introduced myself as Eddie, but he said, Eddie, why are you moving into the city when everyone else is evacuating the city of Buffalo? And the answer was, is Jesus had sent us on a mission, and we were there to show and share the love of Jesus, to plant a church among the urban poor, to see lives transformed and communities impacted. I had an evangelical impulse, but perhaps not a framework to understand evangelicalism as a movement. Uh, I was planting churches then with the, uh, I was the was something called the Home Mission Board at the time of the Southern Baptist Convention, and I had the privilege of planting multiple churches, later became a leader in that denominational tradition, which in and of itself 
tends often not to use the word evangelical to describe and define itself. Foy Valentine, who used to lead one of the agencies of the Southern Baptist Convention, said evangelical was a Yankee word and not something they applied to themselves in the denominational tradition. Well, I am a Yankee, and so thus the word evangelical sort of related to that. So yours kind of went on, and eventually um, I was asked to leave where I was serving at um, Lifeway. I was the vice president of a company called Lifeway. I bet some of you have been in a Lifeway at some point in your life. Anybody been in a Lifeway? Yeah, yeah. yeah do you miss Christian bookstores? Shouldn't have shopped at Amazon, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> Is that too bitter? Because I was the vice president of Lifeway. Um, so anyway, I blame you. Um, so build, this is called building bridges with the audience, David, is how, how this rolls. So I got a phone call. Uh, Lifeway happens to be an agency of the Southern Baptist Convention for which I had served as a church planter, the missiologist at their North American Mission Board, and then the vice president of their publishing company. And I got a phone call from um, Wheaton College, and Wheaton College asked if I would come and lead the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. And so uh, through a series of conversations and prayers, we decided to take that role. And I found myself soon established in a chair named after Billy Graham. I held the Billy Graham Chair of Church Mission and Evangelism at Wheaton College. Billy Graham, Billy and Ruth Graham, of course, the most famous graduates uh, of Wheaton College. And my office was in Billy Graham, what's now called Billy Graham Hall. And so a few months after I got there, I got a phone call from, I had just, I had planted a church in Nashville because that's what I love to do. I love to plant churches. So I had planted a church while the vice president of Lifeway, I just volunteered in the weekend. I wanted to reach people in my neighborhood. We started a church, started in a movie theater. Today they meet in a converted uh, horse barn and amazing that God has blessed them with that facility. So, so I left and I said to Donna, maybe we should plant another church. And she said, no. Um, wasn't a subtle no, it was a no. Not at this time. We're making major changes. We're moving into the Chicagoland area, uh, kind of back to the Northeast where I grew up outside of New York City. I planted a church in Buffalo. Now we're back in the Northeast. It's, it's cold. The winters are long. And so she said, no, let's, let's get plugged into a church. And so I got a phone call from a church called the Moody Church. And the Moody Church, Pastor Irwin Lutzer at that time was the uh, pastor and he was stepping into he didn't retire. We said he became the pastor emeritus of that church. And so they asked me to be the interim of that church. I still remember explaining to my youngest daughter that there was a church named the Moody Church. She said, so are they happy some days and unhappy <laughs> other days? Because for my daughters, they didn't know, who, like most 16-year-olds, they didn't know who Billy Graham was. And they didn't know who D.L. Moody was. Now, so, but here I found myself as the interim pastor of the Moody Church, preaching in that historic downtown church that I bet some of you have been to. It's kind of, it actually, we actually have a trip advisor rating, which is a strange thing for me because it's a tourist attraction, you know, the largest non-columned amphitheater in Chicago. So, in the midst of all of this, seven and a half years ago, I moved to Wheaton College, and soon after that, I became the interim pastor of the Moody Church. And at the same time, it felt like evangelicalism was fraying apart in a very new and unique way. So something that I wasn't particularly passionate about, I was passionate about evangelism. When I left my job at Lifeway to become the uh, head of the uh, Billy Graham Center, uh, the Washington Post uh, asked me to write an article. I had I'd shared a little bit on a video, I think someone from the Post had watched it, and they asked me to write an article about why I was changing jobs. They heard me explain why I was changing jobs, and the reason was is because I wanted to spend the rest of my ministry helping Christians to more effectively show and share the love of Jesus. Lifeway was wonderful, but it was a publisher and a bookstore, and my passion for that, I, I think I did a good job as the vice president that was there, but my passion was to help Christians live on mission. My PhD is in the field of mission and evangelism. So I wrote this article for the Washington Post, and, um, and I didn't pick the title, but I basically pointed to the fact that everyone likes to talk about living by Jesus' teachings, which I think is good, but um, between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, he on four occasions gave some very short teachings, and we actually called those commissions. So in the Washington Post, I wrote about the four commissions of Jesus, including the Great Commission, 
And I ended my article by saying Jesus' last earthly words, between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus' last earthly words should be our first priority. The Washington Post put the headline on it. I don't object to the headline, but the headline was a little punchy. The headline was, call yourself a Christian, start talking about Jesus Christ. And I will tell you that that article became the most um, forwarded article on the Washington Post website for about 36 hours, not because of widespread affirmation of the topic. Turns out that talking about evangelism is a controversial thing. However, I think right now part of the challenge where we find ourselves and where I want to go in our conversation today is that part of what is deterring the forward mission and work of the gospel in its proclamation and demonstration, particularly in the United States today, is some of the difficulties and the problems in evangelicalism that's impacting our evangelism. I will tell you that um, if you read much of the secular press, um, they often use those words interchangeably because they don't, well, I mean, religion reporters know, good religion reporters know. But just today I was reading an article in a British newspaper and they kept talking about evangelism when they meant evangelicalism. So what then is evangelicalism? Catherine Breckis puts it this way. Evangelicalism was a heart-centered, experiential, individualistic, and evangelical form of Protestantism that was intertwined with the rise of the modern world. They share a common faith in biblical authority, human sinfulness, God's sovereignty, and the possibility of redemption, and they drew firm boundaries between those who had been born again, born against, that's a typo, um, born again, and those who do not. Now, I want you to think with me a little bit about what that means, because my guess is some of you would not necessarily place yourself in the evangelical tradition. Let me explain a few reasons why. Uh, the word evangelical has, first it has some historic reasons. If you're a Lutheran, uh, for particularly a German Lutheran, that actually means something else. It actually has some history related to that. Um, if you're African American, African Americans actually identify with evangelical beliefs higher than any other group in America yet are the lowest who identify with those beliefs to actually call themselves evangelical. So in this tradition, in this room here today, there may be people from different backgrounds, different beliefs, and I thought, if it's okay, that it might be uh, fun to find out a little bit about it. I Clearly, there's an Anglican here. We can start at the beginning of the alphabet. Who's the Anglican that went woo at the end? So, oh, you were just enthusiastic about Anglicans. You're actually not one. Uh, if you've been to Wheaton College, everyone eventually converts to Anglicanism, so that's great that you're, that you're there. So we had some Anglicans, um, we have some, some Baptists, so we have Baptists here today, Baptists, I see some Baptists, okay. Former Baptists, okay, I see a lot of those hands. Just going alphabetically, how about, how about charismatic Pentecostals? Raise, raise both hands. Good, yeah, all right, all right. So, um, all right, so I, I see, and again, I could keep going. How many of you, anyone in a cult or a sect or anything of that sort? Okay, I could keep going. But so evangelicalism is a movement that if you had to shrink it down to its three, to three words, which is a very difficult thing to do, but if you had to shrink it down to three words, most of you who use the word evangelical describe or define yourself, and even some people who are evangelical adjacent who don't use the word but have similar beliefs, it kind of boils down to this, um, and I'm going to expand from there. It boils down to orthodox conversionary Protestantism. So again, I'll say it again, because remember where we are, right? We're in Protestantism, so Protestantism here, and of course, I, I, there's so much to unpack that's there. Some historians watching this later on and throwing something at their computer saying, Ed, you've got to say more, but I just tell you, they don't give me hours for this lecture here today, though I would take it if they did. But Protestantism is certainly part of that, but it's Orthodox Protestantism holds to the a small O, not big O like my parents uh, who were Eastern Orthodox, but small O Orthodox means that they hold to the doctrines that Protestants have historically held, the solas of the Reformation, the authority of Scripture. We'll go through some of those things as we go. So Protestant, so I said uh, Orthodox conversionary Protestant, so conversionary. I want you to know that um, throughout the history of the church, not in all times and all places did people see conversion the way most of us here in this room see conversion, right? So on this big map, 
Um, people saw conversion differently. The idea of standing up before people and say, if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, I want to lead you in this prayer. I want you to bow your head with me. Let's confess our sin. You believe in your heart that Jesus has raised him dead. You receive by grace and through faith is not how anybody about 500 or 1,000 years ago would have invited people to trust and faith in Christ. So, but we're conversionary, which does stand out. Now, Cass, when I say these things, all of a sudden exceptions come to mind, and that's, that's okay. You say, well, aren't there some Catholics who are evangelicals? Well, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus because my mother engaged some Catholics who were evangelicals in the Catholic charismatic movement called Curcio. So, yes, there are, and you say, well, aren't there some, some people who are identified as evangelical that aren't necessarily able to articulate conversion? Well, perhaps Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, who said, I didn't have a conversion experience like Billy Graham's telling everyone else to have. I haven't had one. I've been a Christian for as long as I remember and never been anything else. So an Orthodox, of course, is a lot of where the contest, current contesting of evangelical identity comes from, because who gets to define and who gets to describe what's Orthodox and what's not Orthodox. I mentioned Lynn Coick. She and I were trying to model what it would look like from egalitarian to complementarian, from Arminian to Reformed, and, and to say there's a breadth of evangelical orthodoxy that's there. So then what is evangelical and why does it matter? Well, let's do a little history so we can make sure Jack Black is happy. So there are originating streams that come from before the Great Awakening, things like the Enlightenment, where the Enlightenment brought together individualism. Evangelical is deeply, evangelicalism is deeply rooted in individualism to the point where sometimes people in mainline Protestantism, so let me explain, mainline Protestantism would generally be the older denominations, more progressive denominations, so I mentioned the Episcopal Church where I came to faith in Christ, the prior presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Catherine Jeffrey Chiori, spoke of individual conversion as the great Western heresy. So pointing to the Enlightenment and saying the Enlightenment, which itself then birthed into a couple of strands like pietistic revivalism and Puritan revivalism, then brought together some strands that became evangelicalism. And some of those strands had different influences that were actually there, and you still see some of them in evangelicalism. So from pietism, we find things like personal renewal through Scripture, dynamic worship, the, the rejection of dead established religion. Oh, how many times you hear a young evangelical say, I just grew up in this dead church, but I found life here. And then about 20 years later, they convert to Anglicanism and love the liturgy. My daughter, I have three daughters, and they are amazing. My youngest daughter recently, she's a student at Biola University, she asked me, would it be okay if I went to an Anglican church? Because I'm a low church evangelical. When I came to Wheaton College and the faculty personnel interview at the beginning, they were a little nervous whether I'd make it through the faculty personnel screening for some reasons that I won't go into for the sake of time. Went very well, obviously I ended up there. But the first question that I was asked, being a Southern Baptist who's a low church evangelical, I just, let's sing a few songs, let's get open the Bible, let's work through the biblical text, and I'm happy. So the first question they ask in this very serious faculty personnel interview is from some, one of the, a professor in the arts, his name is Mark Lewis, actor by background. He looked at my bio, saw that I was, came to Christ in the Episcopal Church, and the first question this esteemed institution asked me was, do you miss the beauty of the Anglican liturgy? And I just said, not really. And yet, I still ended up at Wheaton College. And I love the beauty of the Anglican liturgy. Don't misunderstand. I had the privilege of living and teaching at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University, actually in partnership with Lanier and the great work that Lanier is doing over there at Yarton. And, and I loved engaging in the beauty of the Anglican liturgy. And I love engaging in the contemporary worship that is at my Southern California megachurch where I'm teaching pastor called the Mariner's Church. So I love the body of Christ and all of its expression, expressions, but certainly that is a pietistic stream. People like Wesley, Count von Zinzendorf, Methodists, Baptists certainly come from some of those streams. And again, I could say so much more, but our time is brief. Puritanism brought its own parts to the stream as well. People like, things like the Liturgy and Sacraments, Divine Covenant, uh, you know, Active Citizenship, Jonathan Edwards being a key voice there. And, Jonathan Edwards becoming a theological hero for me as my theology developed in a more reformed direction later on. But it doesn't end there, so what happens is, is there are certain originating streams that then become dominant identities. 
and we can actually walk through and see some things like populist revivalism. And, uh, and I want to unpack all of this. This is actually um, some things that I'm, I'm writing a book on the future of evangelicalism. You can always tell somebody's writing a book when they have a lot of charts. Um, so um, populist revivalism, and we see this in the rise, for example, of 1795 to 1810, 3,000 churches planted by Baptists and Methodists on the Western frontier. If you're interested, I hosted, a, there's a Duke hosted history journal that, uh, that I wrote an article about Baptists and Methodists on the frontier. You can easily find that if you Google my name. And there's populist revivalism, and then there's institutional revivalism. These are some technical terms. Some of you see Christian republicanism, it doesn't mean the same thing. These are some technical terms that sort of flow out of this. And then there's some anti-revivalism that's still here today. There's a skepticism among some evangelicals towards emotionalism and more. So these historical streams sort of continue and they begin to come together with some level of Protestant fragmentation. I didn't say evangelical fragmentation, yet I said Protestant fragmentation because by the time you get to late 1800s into the mid 1900s, you actually find that mainline Protestants and evangelicals begin to move apart. And that has significant ramifications still to this day. If you look back 100 years ago, well, maybe not 100 years ago. If you look back 150 years ago, there was not much daylight between what we call evangelicalism and what we call mainline Protestantism. Mainline Protestantism can be a little bit of a confusing of a term because it's not really the mainline anymore. Mainline Protestantism has largely been experiencing a numerical collapse over the last few decades. That's not a word that I use casually, that's a word that mainline Protestant researchers use to describe the state of mainline Protestantism. So what's happened is mainline Protestantism, which was, the Episcopal Church was once called the Republican Party at prayer, declined so substantially and evangelicalism begins to take its place as the predominant religious non-Catholic expression in America. And all this sort of takes place with some different dominant identities that flow from here. And again, we, we can kind of see that the anti-modernist, there's a modernist fundamentalist controversy. And if you call yourself an evangelical today, your great grandparents who believe pretty much or close to the same thing called themselves fundamentalists because it's based on the five fundamentals of the faith. I served as the interim pastor at Moody Church for four years. Nobody should serve as the interim pastor of anything for four years. I was the interim pastor of Moody Church for longer than four of their actual pastors were the actual pastor of Moody Church. But when I left there, I started an interim in New York City at a church that Stephen Olford used to pastor and several, and, and where much of fundamentalism received its intellectual fuel. And there were certain things that I bet if I said to you today, what fundamentalists said made up the fundamentals. It would be like the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That's fundamentalism. Because, now, again, it's not just that. It's the bodily return. It has to do with the authority of Scripture and more. So these anti-modernists eventually birth things like fundamentalism and dispensationalism. And by 1949, everyone who probably believes, not in every way like us, but similar to us, they called themselves fundamentalists. So when one of the first great neo-evangelicals wrote something to speak to the, what would become the evangelical movement, his name was Carl Henry, and he wrote this book, The Uneasy Conscience, he was calling for what we would call evangelicals to care about issues of societal and social concern, and the title of his book was The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism. So modern fundamentalism became neo-evangelicalism, which became what we call evangelicalism today, whereas modernists sort of were focused more on social justice, people like Walter Rauschenbuch and Fosdick and so others, and, and that becomes mainline Protestantism. And then there are whole streams, for example, the historic black church, which I think we can learn a lot from today in modern evangelicalism, because the historic black church, having been marginalized on the edge of society for centuries, still has thrived and lived on mission. But then we find the ascendancy, right? And this just jumping across sort of a long distance of time, uh, we actually see some things begin to change. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of uh, things that start to take place outside of established churches. I call those some entrepreneurial evangelical movements. And when you think of people like Billy Graham or John Stott or Bill Bright or Francis Schaeffer, you know what they all have in common? You don't actually probably know what church they were a part of. <laughs> 
because they were all of a sudden outside the church speaking into the church. So, of course, we know Campus Crusade and Crew or Youth for Christ, which is Billy Graham, eventually the BGEA itself, or John Stott through multiple means like Lausanne and more. And these movements begin to shape evangelicalism from the edges, but then they move towards the center. But still, there's a mainstream of evangelicalism. You can actually see that I intentionally put Billy Graham on both of those categories because he straddled all of it. It's hard to describe evangelicalism without the centrality of the influence of Billy Graham. And I think this is a key thing for you to remember because a couple, it's been more than one person has said this, and it sounds like a joke, but it's really not. So one scholar was once asked, how do you define an evangelical? It's somebody who likes Billy Graham. And I know it is funny, but it's, it's actually, it actually makes some sense. Because if you think about people, maybe in mainline Protestantism, who might not be driven in the same way by orthodox, orthodox conversionism. So my guess is, some of you are familiar with churches that, you know, they're not getting up every morning saying, how do we see people come to faith in Christ as new believers who are dead in their trespasses and sins receive the good news of the gospel by grace and through faith. That's a lot of individual conversions, not the focus in mainline Protestantism or in the same way that it's not the focus in much of Catholicism. Of course, there are exceptions to that in all these different kinds of places. So, if you're on, maybe left and right are probably too simplistic for this discussion, but if you're on the left side of where Billy Graham is, maybe his passion for winning people to Jesus is not a passion that resonates with you. But if you're on the right side of where Billy Graham is, you're in something called fundamentalism. There are 13,000 independent fundamental Baptist churches alone in the United States, whole movements with schools and churches and magazines and influence that now largely operate under the radar. And they didn't like Billy Graham because he was working with other people who they didn't agree with. So what's an evangelical? In some ways, someone who likes Billy Graham. Well, what would be three words that might describe Billy Graham? He was an orthodox conversionary Protestant. And of course, you have movements that around the world have become movements that are larger than evangelicalism itself, movements like the charismatic evangelical, charismatic Pentecostal world. I just returned from uh, Amsterdam, where there were 6,000 Pentecostals in the um, convention center, the same convention center that 40 years ago prior, Billy Graham gathered the evangelists of the world to talk about the Great Commission. And now the Pentecostals gathered in Amsterdam, 6,000 of them, and said, we're going to take up that mantle, and by 2033, we're going to get the gospel to every person to hear the good news of the gospel by the 2,000th anniversary of what I would say is the Great Commission, they would say is the coming of Pentecost, because they're Pentecostals. And of course, they're outsider groups that are still here, part of that conversation, and more. So I guess then the question becomes, I'm going to switch slides here for just a moment, the question becomes, how should we respond to where we are today? Because when I go through and kind of explain some of what's going on, we also recognize, boy, it sure feels like evangelicalism is conflicted, is divided, is broken, and may be beyond repair. Now, I will tell you, I'm, I, I'm not of the view that evangelicalism is beyond repair, but I am also perpetually optimistic because I've read the end of the book and Jesus wins. So I just want to be on that part of the mission where we join him in that mission faithfully and fruitfully showing and sharing the love of Jesus. Yet evangelicalism is in a time, I don't think it's too strong to say that it's in a time of great crisis. There's a bit of a knot. I recently had a text conversation with a dear friend. Some of you would know who it is. The movement of which he was a part is focused on church planting and evangelism. And they recently had come to basically a standstill with their board because they just couldn't get to the place where they agreed with who they should be and where they should go. Should they be focused primarily on missions and evangelism? Should they be more engaged in the culture war? Should they, should they distance themselves from this group or connect with this group? And I texted him this, we are living in a new era and there will be greater conflict. We're going to have to get used to it. Stand up and do what's right. I'm glad you did stand up and do what's right and I'm glad to call you friend. I just think we need to say to one another that this moment is going to require women and men of courage are going to stand up and say there's a movement worth preserving. Now, it could be just as easy to say, well, let's just walk away from it. You could ask the question, is, has evangelical religion any distinctive principles? I answer, it has. Are they worth contending for? I answer, they are. Now, if you recognize that name, you might have actually been to Wycliffe Hall, one of the founders of Wycliffe Hall. So this is over a hundred years ago. These questions 
still remain. So when we talk about evangelicalism, we have contested evangelical identities, we have the reality of our fragmentation, and I'm going to end with an exhortation to reclaiming evangelical mission. So what are some of those contested evangelical identities? What is that? Now, if you live in Texas, the conversation may be different than the conversation you're, we've had in Chicago and certainly different than the conversation we're having in California, but this is often an American conversation. I just returned from speaking to a Baptist denomination in Canada, uh, the, I think the largest Baptist denomination in Canada. They were united, they were happy, they were on mission, so it is actually possible. However, here we can feel the fragmentation in denominations from the PCA to the SBC to others. We can feel the fragmentation in the public discourse. We can see it on social media and more. The challenge for a definition of evangelicalism is uniting what needs to be united. What is this thing we're supposed to pull together? Excising what needs to be ex I mean, we would all agree there's some things that are not healthy in the movement that should not be part of the movement. The problem is we disagree on what that is. There are people who would think that this needs to come out of the movement. People think Ed Stetzer is an unhealthy part of the movement correcting what needs to be corrected, forgiving who needs to be forgiving. So part of the challenge is to sort of look at how you even define the movement. How do you define the movement? So there are ways to do that, and, and all those ways have strengths and weaknesses. For example, you can say evangelicals by self-identity. Does someone say that they're an evangelical? Okay, then they're an evangelical. But we actually found in the last few years that more people are saying that they're an evangelical and they're doing so because of their political identification and are less involved, not more involved in church. So that complicates the definition, doesn't it? Is it an evangelical by historic denomination? If you're evangelical covenant church, certainly that's evangelical. I just met earlier today with someone from ECO, the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians. If you're even some denominations that don't use the word evangelical to describe themselves generally, Southern Baptists now do, but the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod generally does not, but people tend to put them in that category for, because they tend to be more conservative and evangelical. So historical denomination. Whereas if you're mainline Protestant, and right now before our eyes we're seeing Methodism split into one evangelical group, well, more than one evangelical group and one mainline Protestant group, could be evangelical by political or demographic profile. That's the way the media loves to define evangelicals. I was recently asked to be a guest at the, uh, the, this forum. Um, this, it's called the Atlantic Festival. So you have the Atlantic Magazine, been around a long time, and, and they have these people come in. And the person before me was Constance Wu, the actress. The person later in the day was Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary. And there was I in the middle of them. It was like that Sesame Street rhyme, one of these things is not like the other. Um, and they want to talk about evangelicalism. All they wanted to talk about was politics. And I, and I said, that's not how we primarily think of ourselves. Yet, comes back, comes back. And I kept pointing back to it. So, Leith Anderson and I wrote an article in Christianity Today saying, let's not define evangelicals by politics. And then, that was 2016, and the rest is history. And sometimes it's evangelicals by belief. That's the way that I prefer. And just full disclosure, when I was leading Lifeway Research, we worked with the National Association of Evangelicals to create a definition, a research-based definition of evangelicalism. So let's do that here right now. Right now. I'm not going to like ask you to raise your hands, and if you didn't raise your hands correctly, ask you to leave. Um, but evangelical beliefs, this is the official definition adopted by the National Association of Evangelicals. Leith Anderson loved to say this. He said, I think, Leith said, I think evangelicals should define who they are just as if, and he talks specifically about uh, American Indian, Native American tribes who define what makes tribal identity or not. So the National Association of Evangelicals in partnership with Liferay Research, and this is obviously a project I was very vested in, said this is what evangelicals believe. Evangelical beliefs are that you strongly agree with the response to all four statements. The Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. I'm just looking at Jarrett to make sure he's nodding his head that he believes these things and the people at Champion Forest believe these things. It's very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus as their Savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin and only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's, work, or, excuse me, God's free gift of eternal salvation. Lynn Koch and I could joyfully work together on a podcast because we hold those beliefs. 
Now, my guess is you hold those evangelical beliefs, mostly. And so how then do you describe by beliefs? Well, not everyone describes it and defines it by beliefs. You can actually define it in a lot of ways, by an, as an embattled subculture. There are whole books about that. As a lobby interest group, there are whole books about that. As a sociological category, there are books about that. And as a religious movement, there are books about that. So the most famous definition of evangelical or description, or perhaps an attempt to define it, is actually by a British historian by the name of David Bebbington. And he said, there are four things that make up evangelicalism. He said, conversionism, you heard that from me earlier, biblicism, high view of the scripture. Americans tend to use, in evangelical traditions, tend to use the word inerrancy. That's less commonly used in other traditions in other countries. Uh, the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy is something that a lot of evangelicals use to describe and define. Uh, for example, institutions like Wheaton College actually have inerrancy in their doctrinal statements. Activism and crucicentrism. Now, of course, Others always try to put their own stamp on it. Um, my colleague at Wheaton, uh, Tim Larson, had the Larson Pentagon. I, in hindsight, don't think pentagrams are a great way to describe the evangelical faith, but I had to leave Wheaton College over this alone. Um, but Tim, I think, helps us because he ties in Orthodox Protestantism, cross-centered faith, which is just crucicentrism, emphasis on the Holy Spirit. He himself is charismatic Pentecostal, the Bible's preeminence, and historical revivalism. However, we are not united by the Bevington Quadrilateral or the Larson Pentagon. I actually propose a different model, which I'll put in the book. We won't have time to do all that, but I just want to talk about for a moment the reality of our fragmentation. Um, we're experiencing, in my view, something that hasn't been, we, we kind of have this lull Evangelicals are always arguing about who they are, who's in, who's out. And I know that really bothers some people. I don't know that it needs to bother some people. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, again, we can go back to J.C. Lyle. You know, what is evangelical identity? Is it worth contending for? But right now we're in a time when there are all kinds of people moving in and out of the evangelical movement. In the book, I, I walk through and I kind of describe some of what those things look like. There's the historic mainstream of evangelicalism. Um, and I actually have, um, I'm trying to decide time-wise, I probably won't go, I do have like all kinds of stuff for you, but not for you today. Um, <laughs> but when we look at some of these things, maybe even during the Q&A, there are people here whose movement has been split recently because some people wanted a renewal of evangelicalism, some people want to keep things the same way. There's been a rise of neo-fundamentalism. Now, again, fundamentalism is a very tricky word to describe and define. But in my world, I used to be like on the most conservative side of most places. If you were to come to Wheaton College, the Wheaton College faculty would find me among the most conservative of the faculty that are there. That was there. And now there's a, another lane that's formed to the right that looks at conservative evangelicalism and says, you are not conservative enough. It's the rise of neo-fundamentalism. Christian nationalism is interesting because part of the problem right now is because some people, in, particularly in maybe a, a less informed media world, have decided that it, any reference to uh, God related to our country is therefore Christian nationalism. But when everything's Christian nationalism, nothing really is Christian nationalism. Yet at the same time, I remember writing an article for the Dallas Morning News about the challenges and some of the dangers in and around Christian nationalism. And when I wrote it back in a few, maybe three or four years ago, um, people got mad at me. So, oh, there's no such thing, no such thing. Now there are whole books and movements that describe themselves as such. And they would say that people in historic mainstream evangelicalism have missed the cultural moment and need to learn how to fight differently because the world has turned in a more negative direction. Um, there are anti-evangelical. We feel that. We feel that as well. There are people who, uh, who are ex-evangelicals and still quite orthodox. There are people who no longer use the term, who kind of sort of distance themselves from it. Sometimes they actually become big O orthodox, sometimes little O orthodox as well. Michael Graham in his book, the six way, his article, The Six-Way Fracturing of Evangelicalism, wrote in Mere Orthodoxy, he talked about neo-fundamentalist evangelical, mainstream evangelical, neo-evangelical, post-evangelical, de-churched, but with some Jesus, de-churched and de-converted. I, I expanded, and I rely on that, cite that, and expand on that 
in some categories. I, again, I, I don't, we don't have time to do this, but, but I do kind of walk through each of these things and sort of talk about them. But let me just jump forward to the, to the end of how we reclaim evangelical mission. Um, so I also propose that evangelicalism itself needs to rethink some of its priorities. And I think ultimately that we need to put more at the center what all evangelicals actually think and know when they talk to one another. Here's what we think and we know when we talk to one another. Not everyone who uses the word Christian to describe themselves as a Christian the way we understand it and the way we understand it, they've had some regenerative experience, they were dead in their trespasses and sins, and they have been born again by the power of the gospel. I think that is not one of four things. I think that's the central definition of evangelicalism. And that perhaps comes from my bias as someone who's a church planter and an evangelist when I was preaching at D.L. Moody's pulpit and sitting in Billy, Billy Graham's academic chair that I think ultimately a rediscovery of a priority would make a difference. Now again, I'm still in the process of writing the book, so this is still a draft that I'll put up here, but I wanna think in terms of a, um, of a tent. When Billy Graham died, maybe some of you in this room joined us at his funeral in Charlotte, and they put it under a tent, and I think a tent is a good picture for evangelicalism to describe it. It gives us a little more, uh, a little more diverse expressions. What's a higher value, what's a lower value, but still what's part of the tent? So for me, I talk about the center pole. The center pole of evangelicalism is conversion. And we think that way. We, when we're by ourselves in interfaith dialogues, and we might say, somebody in a different tradition say, but I think they're genuinely born again. Because conversion is so central to the evangelical understanding. Now, I also would say to you that there's an individual that's there that comes with some challenges that we could unpack, and maybe we will in the Q&A. I think then if we think of a tent, there's a pole in the middle of the tent that holds it together and that is conversion. Then there's ropes that flow from that pole that hold the tent together. And those ropes, I believe, are actually mission. Now, the mission, Jesus says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. When you think of one another, we think of one another as working together. So I will go from here to on Monday morning to host a meeting of the heads of church planting of all the evangelical denominations in America, and we will learn from one another to accelerate church planting and evangelism in America. And then I will go from there to Las Vegas, where Luis Palau's son and I, Kevin Palau from the Luis Palau Association, will work with the He Gets Us campaign that some of you have seen the ads, and Las Vegas is going to be the Super Bowl, and we are gathering dozens of pastors together to so show how can we serve the hurting and show the love of Jesus in and around the Super Bowl, and we will have in that room Pentecostals and non-denominational and Presbyterians. Why? Because the rope that holds this movement together is attached to conversion, but it actually holds the movement together. So we look in that room and we're like, you got the same mission that I do. And then I think I refer to some tent poles. I'm debating between four or five tent poles, but those tent poles do sound like what you've seen in other places, um, biblical authority personal piety, voluntarist impulse, evangelistic cooperation. I'm debating what exactly those terms will be. But perhaps something else that I think is also important is that a tent has an edge, an end. There's something outside the tent and there's something inside the tent. And one of the challenges that evangelicalism is facing today is the inability to say, because there's no one who can say it, that's outside the tent of evangelicalism. Billy Graham used to say it, others used to say it, but I think ultimately acknowledging that there's a tent and there's a canvas and there are tent flaps and that tent is, the edge of that tent is orthodoxy. I think ultimately evangelicals are gonna have to be clearer about what they believe about the gospel, the authority of scripture, and ultimately about some cultural and social issues that people right now are a little nervous in some places to articulate. So where do we go from here? Well, I actually think we can um, reclaim the evangelical mission. I think part of that is a season of lament to acknowledge that this has not gone well the last few decades. Maybe we miss the guiding hand of somebody like Billy Graham and others around him like Harold Ockengay and like Carl Henry, but now we want to listen to more voices than just those, but certainly we want to listen to those, but as evangelical has become more diverse, people of different cultures and backgrounds and races, men and women together speaking into what the movement should be, but we can acknowledge that right now it's not going well. I think a theological discipleship could really matter. I think one of the mistakes of a, what otherwise in some ways was a wonderful thing back in the 80s and the 90s when churches like mine, Mariner's Church, which is everything wonderful about a Southern California megachurch and, and all the challenges and everything that 
kind of frightens people away. It's all those things. But churches like mine in the 80s and the 90s brought boomers back to church by the thousands by making it clear that this was practical and this was helpful and in doing so maybe downplayed some of the theological distinctives and then we found the shift in culture that required a new set of answers and questions and people unprepared to do so, to engage that moment. We need theological discipleship. We need reforming of institutions. Evangelicalism in some ways is a network of connected institutions and some of those institutions probably need to align better with their evangelical constituencies in the evangelical movement. And then I make a proposal that I want to unpack for you here about how we prioritize uh, gospel proclamation in the midst of it. One of the areas my field is missiology, and there's something called uh, int- integral mission. And the idea is that we will um, join Jesus on his mission. We're serving the hurting, uh, and we're joining Jesus on his mission to save the lost. So Jesus came serving the hurting. He came saving the lost. We join him in those two things. But historically, Christians have really struggled with caring for the hurting and still caring that women and men might respond by grace and through faith to the good news of the gospel. The beginning of the last century, the kingdom of God movement, we saw very quickly within two decades moving away from evangelistic proclamation and only focusing on societal transformation. In the mid-50s and 60s in the Missio Dei movement, we saw the same movement happen again in the missionary movement around the world. I think that for there to be a vibrant evangelical movement in the future, we're going to both show and share the love of Jesus in the midst of a broken and hurting world. We're going to do so because we are orthodox conversionary Protestants. We're going to have to have some hard decisions of what should and should not define our movement, but the end result to me is, and I'm not, I don't know the future. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work at a nonprofit organization, so I don't know the future. (laughs) But I know this. Understanding the fragmentation of evangelicalism also helps us to untie the evangelical knot and to end with the words of J.C. Lyle, I think evangelical religion has some distinctive principles and they are worth contending for and I hope you'll join with me in that as well. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you. Mark's going to come and lead us in a few minutes. First, totally unrelated to your topic. Um, but related to the introduction that David Capes gave. How do you keep your finger on culture's pulse? Mm -hmm. Capes said you've done a better job of that than any of his friends, small circle of people, but where (laughs) do you, how do you, how do you, sorry, how, how, I'm joking, of course. How do you keep your finger on culture's pulse? What do you, what, what would you, give us three ways. Yeah, so I think it's a little bit, um, important to say that I don't think that if you're a pastor or church leader that you should have your finger on the pulse of culture in the same way that I do as a missiologist. It's my job to do that. I bet you know more about talcum powder than anyone else in this room, and there's a reason for that, okay? But that's your job to know that. So it's my job to read and digest all kinds of things that are in different cultural currents. So I know what's going on in denominations. I try to know what's going on in culture. So that is literally, and if you're a pastor and church leader, I bet you know that this family has a teenager that's a wayward teenager, and they're struggling with that. So a lot of it has to do with the, the what you spend your time and your focus on. So evangelicals, for good or for ill, sort of look to me to explain the cultural moment. I'm a missiologist by training. So what a missiologist normally would be doing is training missionaries to reach the Pocot in Africa or the Quechua in the highlands of Peru. I try to train evangelicals in the West to understand the cultural moment so we can be faithful and fruitful in it. So that's what I do all day, every day. And so it just, that's where the, a lot of that flows. So I, I read a lot, you know, I, I subscribe to probably 13, 14 different peri- periodicals. So I try to keep up. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I try to faithfully represent evangelical Christianity in the public sphere, which is not, not always so easy. Do you watch shows? I do. Do you watch Game of Thrones? I did not. Do you watch shows that you think are culturally important, even if you don't agree with their values? I didn't watch Game of Thrones, not because of its cultural importance, but because of my own sinfulness. Um, but I do watch other shows for cultural importance uh, as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, next question. How would you go about working with other denominations to share the gospel when theological pushback occurs? Is there a specific approach that works better than another? Yeah, it's a great question. And the question then becomes, what do those other denominations have in common? 
So this, this week, I spoke at two different denominations, one in the United States and one in Canada. And um, I've, I've had the privilege of, of, I believe, keynoting the national meeting of 62 different denominations, from Anabaptist to Wesleyan to Methodist to Pentecostal to Presbyterian. So, but I would say that all of them have a generally in common view of the authority of Scripture, of the necessity and the way people come to faith in Christ. The challenge becomes when we end up in conversations and traditions that don't hold those things. And I, in that case, the person, I think the question was work together. I think that there comes a point where I can't work together, I have interfaith dialogue with other faiths and other traditions as well. So let's take Mormonism. Mormonism is a distinct faith, out, out, um, a distinct religion outside of Christianity. Uh, I think having conversations, I've been in some conversations with uh, leaders in the LDS church and more. I think that's an interfaith conversation. When I'm working with uh, Presbyterians and Pentecostals, that's I'm working together generally for conversion, p- common prayer. And you know, I'm, some of you have seen the He Gets Us ad, so I'm part of the kind of leadership council for He Gets Us. We're working towards helping people have conversations about Jesus, those kinds of things. So there are different levels of working together. I'll give you one final example. Um, most of you uh, probably have a love and appreciation for Tim Keller. Uh, I very much miss him. But I was speaking once at a ho- conference that Tim hosted. He and I were speakers at it. And during the Q&A, somebody asked, can you and Tim Keller cooperate on planting churches together? And I said, we can cooperate on training for planting churches. We can cooperate on evangelism that leads to church planting. But Tim Keller, as a Presbyterian and me as a Baptist, we actually can't plant churches together because we, we have to decide whether we need a cup or a tub at the first baptism. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are Pentecostals, I'm deeply thankful for you, but you would want people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues, following conversion, or for those of you who are whatever. There's, so there's enough differences that church planting, we tend to tend our own garden, but when it comes to common prayer and evangelism, but in some cases, Francis Schaeffer explained, we're co-belligerents with people. I can work together in the fight against pornography with Mormons and, and irreligious people and feminists, Right? I, can, I can work with people who, are, who have no religion and lots of religion in the fight against social ill. So that's co-belligerence, but working together is a different thing. Okay, I've got a section. You're of, just going to do these on the fly. This is why you're a good lawyer. <laughs> no, I like no, that. No. Um, I've got a section of questions yeah. that I'm going to read through. Okay, great. But I'm going to group them all together because I'm going to ask you a question about these. Yes, sir. All right? One question. What is pen- Pentecostalism? And, okay. Or what is Pentecostal and what do they do? Yeah. Next question. Take over the world, by as the way, a, is the answer. As a fellow Baptist, <laughs> what led you to becoming a Southern Baptist? Okay. Another one. Is Joel Osteen, where is Joel Osteen on the evangelical scale? Uh-huh. Another one was written in Disappearing Ink. <laughs> Another that was one, in tongues and you can't interpret it. it. it yes. Uh, so, uh, 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 too soon? Is that okay? Uh, no. Is that okay? Just check it. Can you be an evangelical without being an er, uh, in- inerrantist? Uh, inerrantist? Right, right. Yes. Um, and what do we see in the increasing ecumenism uh, between evangelicals, RCC, and Eastern Orthodoxy? Great. And wow. then the final one. These are great questions. Yeah, these are good, yeah. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. put them all together uh-huh. for a reason. Yeah. Some evangelicals contend you represent Big Eva. Big Eva and have compromised biblical teachings for worldly acceptance right. instead of representing biblical orthodoxy. Right, right. How do you respond to that? Now, don't do that. Yeah. So with all of those questions, yeah. here's my question. <laughs> you know, I could go through all those questions. You're tempting I me. I know you could, okay. but we don't have time. Okay, sorry. So here's my question. <laughs> He's the boss. Must we care yeah. about the label evangelical if we're simply doing the Lord's work. Mm-hmm. Why is the label, maybe it's handy, Yep. maybe it's useful, yep. maybe we can figure out who sits on the row with us mm-hmm. and who we need to be working on, mm-hmm. but is it necessary that we even use the label? No. You want me to go through the rest of those or just go for that? No. Uh, it, <laughs> well, I mean, all of these are people who are concerned about the label. Yeah, sure, sure. I think the label, labels define what something believes. It's a grouping, a label is a grouping of ideas that are described by a single word. So the grouping of ideas that are described by this single word, I think really do matter. 
I think the authority of Scripture. In answer to your question, I do not think that every evangelical has to use the word inerrancy, but I think ultimately that has become a handy shorthand for that. But I think evangelicals hold to the authority of Scripture. So Pentecostals, Pentecostals tend to believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is subsequent from conversion with initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. They tend to be in the Arminian tradition. I think that the fact that they uh, believe in personal conversion, they tend to have a high view of Scripture, that they meet some of those descriptive definitions. So the word is simply a description of a category of beliefs that my guess is, Mark, and for many of us here, we actually choose who we partner with at Lanier Theological Seminary based on some of those beliefs. We probably choose uh, who we partner with together on common strategies in our cities and communities based on those beliefs. Now, as probably the, one of the most ecumenical people in this room, I think you can be broadly evangelical ecumenist, and that's the term that my critics have actually used to describe me, evangelical ecumenist. Uh, I think that ultimately there are common beliefs that define that we're of the same beliefs that these people are, and I put Pentecostals, Presbyterians, and others in that. Which brings me to my next question Please. about all of those. Yes. And what you've just said. Yeah. And I, this, is, this is called a softball. Okay, so now I come bring it on. Is this the 21st century, uh, it, could this be termed fairly, a 21st century equivalent of the Corinthian problem that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 1, when he says, some of you say I'm of Apollo, some of you say I'm of Peter, some of you say I'm of Christ, some of you say I'm of, you know, and I mean, did Paul die for your sins or were you baptized in Paul? You know, he's saying, I resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Amen. And he really goes after the schisms that were label-based schisms that no doubt in their mind were very important over very important issues because Apollo said something distinctly from the way Paul said it. And by golly, we want to be right. Yep. I would put those descriptions more in denominational categories. I love Presbyterians who baptize babies. I love Pentecostals who pray for people to baptize in the Holy Spirit. I love Arminians who actually think you can apostatize. And I love Baptists who are challenging at times. Um, <laughs> so I guess the question is, is in what category do we place ourselves? And the description of evangelicalism is a pretty small categorical description. Again, conversionism, biblicism activism, we're just using Babington's quadrilateral here, crucicentrism. So you said, I want to know nothing other than Christ and Christ crucified. How are you going to describe and define that? So the Christians in the world gathered in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1910. John R. Mott gathered them together, and they gathered under the theme, the evangelization of the world in this generation. They said, we're going to, know, we're going to have no doctrinal statement other than Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, then you're on the team with us. The problem is, about 10 years later, they kind of questioned, what do we mean by believe in Jesus? And about 20, 10 years after that, they questioned, what do we believe about conversion? And they redefined evangelism, and evangelicalism moved away. And today, the descendants of those movements and traditions would actually lack a clear call to Christ and Christ crucified. So what we've learned from history is, is that when you put aside theology in the name of unity, you end up ultimately with a theology that doesn't unify anyone on a common mission. So I think that a uh, minimalist but not reductionistic description of evangelicalism. So minimalist is, so in this room, and I gave the example of Lynn Coick and I who are on probably different sides of some of the evangelical debates. So, we, but we say we're in this together, right? And with Pentecostals and Presbyterians and non-denominational, et cetera, et cetera. So that's minimalist, but not reductionistic. Because when you reduce it down to, well, it doesn't matter what you believe about the authority of the Bible. I know you think it matters what we believe about the authority of the Bible. It doesn't matter what you believe about people coming to faith in Christ. It doesn't matter about what you believe about some cultural issues today. Those things do matter, and particularly as evangelicals are less and less in the mainstream and more and more to the cultural side, I think ultimately we're going to need one another, and what's happening, we're fraying apart rather than pulling together. All right, next question. Has the prosperity gospel hurt evangelicalism? Sure. I think the prosperity gospel is a false teaching that's had huge destruction in evangelicalism. Next, what place does social conservatism, i.e., life issues, traditional views of marriage, gender, and sexuality matters, etc., have as a unifying or divisive system of beliefs? 
Yeah, I wouldn't call them, what, what, how do they describe that? Social? Social conservatism. Social conservatism. Being conservative right. on social issues. Right. I think that social conservatism on, so, on cultural issues um, is seen by the world as a political thing. I think those are actually biblical teachings that should reflect what we believe and teach in our churches. And I think part of that outside of the tent of Protestant orthodoxy, that those three things that were listed are inside of the tent of what it means to be an evangelical. What cultural issues today are having the most negative effect on spreading the gospel? Well, I think it's actually a f the assumption is that the most negative thing, and I think it, I mean, there, there's truth to it, is the assumption is, is that Christians are out of step on sexual ethics. Um, if there was a vote held in the United States today to legalize gay marriage, it would pass overwhelmingly. There's only a couple, two or three states where it wouldn't pass. So evangelicals, Catholics, and Mormons are sort of the outliers in, on issues of same-sex marriage. So I think for a lot of people, um, there is a rejection of evangelical churches, but also Catholic and, 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 and Mormon faith and others over that issue. However, what most, for example, the, the, uh, I recently, I do a podcast, which is called the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, David, so I wanted you to know that. So, um, and I recently had on um, just this most recent episode, I had Frank Newport from Gallup, I had Greg Smith from Pew, I had David Kinneman from Barna, and I had Scott McConnell from Lifeway Research. What you find is, you know why most people reject these things? It's actually not because of social issues. It's because they're too busy and they're not paying attention and they're not, they're not thinking about evangelicalism. They're not thinking about where you're out of step with culture. So I think the answer is there are certainly a common theme in polls is that Christians being out of step with the culture on sexual ethics is a deterrent. Simultaneously, I think most people just aren't paying attention and a neighbor who loves them and shows and shares the love of Jesus with them goes a long way to build that bridge. Um, would you consider social conservatism, or have you noticed a distinction in social conservatism between people who will quickly soapbox on sexual identity issues mm -hmm. and things of that nature, biblically based, but who shy away from issues of immigrant issues, yeah. immigration issues, mm -hmm issues of people who are just as worthy in God's eyes as white Anglo-Saxon Americans, uh, uh, and, and yet we don't seem to make those so readily soapbox issues. Have you noticed that? Yeah, in Catholic, in Catholic social thought, they tend to track it together where life, uh, abortion, sexuality, openness to immigrants and refugees all sort of track together. In evangelicalism, they, the social issues tend to correlate with other social issues. So if you tend to be pro-traditional marriage and pro-life, you actually tend to be more anti-immigrant, not just anti-illegal immigrant, though you certainly are higher on that. And again, I recognize even using those terms, people can test how you describe those terms. But you also tend to be anti-immigration at a higher level. Um, you tend to be, for example, pro-capital punishment more. So those social issues tend to correlate together in a way in America that actually is not the same in global evangelicalism. So. It's okay. not always the case. Related question, how well is the church doing with engaging refugees in America? I actually think the church is doing pretty well in engaging refugees. There are eight refugee resettlement organizations that the government under Democrats and Republicans works with together. One of them is World Belief. Um, at every church I've been a part of, we have adopted refugee families that have come in. I bet your church has as well. And I think ultimately, um, or relief, and there's uh, Luther, there's Catholic social services and others. Uh, I think ultimately um, the, the churches consistently step up. Now you got to remember, refugees are not the same thing as immigrants. It's I mean, refugees are immigrants, but not all immigrants are refugees, and we don't have time to unpack all that. But I think the church does pretty well. I think there's always a place, and I don't even know you. We've never talked about this, but I think. There's a place of debate, like what is a good immigration strategy for a nation? What's a good refugee number for a nation to take in? I think Christians, or for example, what, what, what's a good marginal tax rate? Now I've looked through the whole Bible and Jesus never gives us the right marginal tax rate for a nation. Uh, actually, he, you knew you knew. You know, it's does. in second opinion. That's okay. Second it's, opinions, it, yeah, chapter yeah, yeah, four, yeah. No, verse no, eleven. No. So clearly, so would, you weren't a biblical language yeah. major. Yeah. So um, I would say all, all of those things matter, and I think we can discuss and debate. I think we discuss and debate without the dehumanization that sometimes we hear, which I even heard in your question, when we speak of people as if they're animals to be kept away. You know, it's fascinating, and, and this isn't meant to be a dialogue, it's more Q&A, and I apologize for interjecting, but the way you, you phrase that is, is insightful. Um, 
if, if you were in law school and you were taking a tax class, one of the first things you would learn is that the tax code is based upon social justice issues. And so there's a real question in the tax code of what do you value and what don't you value? Because you try to tax things more readily. For example, the, the tobacco tax is real high in America. And the reason why is to try to disinterest people in smoking. They will change tax law to try to further certain social agendas and certain agendas of the various people who pass the tax laws. But the whole premise behind it is one of, and, and it was the biblical premise as well when Jesus was challenged on whether or not it's right to pay taxes. The question was, why should a good Jew give money to a Roman government that is absolutely pagan and idolatrous? And isn't it more appropriate not to give them the money? Because that taxation question does reflect certain cultural values. And anyway, it's just interesting. Anyway. And you know, King Charles just announced this week, we're back to the King's speech the first time. Exactly and right. King Charles just announced that they, you, if you're 14 years old or older, you will, or younger, you will never buy cigarettes again. This concludes us. Would you join me in giving a great Texas thank you oh, to thank Ed you. Stetzer?